Welcome. This is Martin Brossman. I'm Greg Heyer. And I'm Elise Archer. And you're at our next show on social selling. I'm excited about this show because we're going to learn something about video today. That's right. Uh, first, let's start a little bit with some uh, with some quick LinkedIn news. I uh, came across a, uh, a post uh, that had actually talked about how LinkedIn may be testing auto-playing of YouTube videos in the activity stream. So this is kind of exciting. Uh, and it actually kind of relates to, our, to the guests we have with us today, which uh, we'll get to in just a second. Yeah. Uh, so just look at him. Um, <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so uh, we uh, uh, so, so I, I think this could be a pretty cool feature for the future uh, of what's happening on LinkedIn. We know that on certain platforms like Facebook and Twitter, video audio plays or uh, auto plays. Uh, so continue to watch for this. If you see something auto play yeah, inside the activity stream, then you know take advantage of it, comment on it, like it, or something like that. Just let somebody know that you saw it, or if you hated it, make sure you comment, say you hated it. Um, and if we share something and you're following our company page or following us. Uh, you know, leave a leave a little note saying you saw it. So, all right. What about our sponsor today? So let's uh, let's talk about real quick about our sponsor. Our sponsor is uh, NC State Technology Training Solutions. As you can see, uh, you know, this is if, if you ever driving through uh, through Raleigh and uh, on Western Boulevard. This is the uh, most uh, one of the coolest engineering feats that uh, appear on Western Boulevard, aside from the WRAL Tower. Uh, so, anyways, if you are interested in le learning about continuing your education. Uh, as a working professional, such as you want to learn about social selling, you can come and take our social selling course. Uh, if you want to get your social media management certificate, Martin has a nice 12 week course. It's a 12 week course with Karen Teedy, and then Greg and I do the social selling mm -hmm. with LinkedIn program right. here. And there are many more. There are many more. Like if you want to learn about Excel, if you want to learn programming, if you want to learn how to use Photoshop, uh, or even Google Docs for work. Uh, we, there's a bunch of courses here. Uh, NC State Technology Training Solutions is a nonprofit arm of the continuing education program here at NC State. So be sure to check them out. Go to linkingintosales.com slash N-C-S-U-T-T-S to be directed to the correct location to learn more. So let's get into the episode. Absolutely. This so, is episode 85. I know. And uh, we yeah. know that like la last year, uh, people were talking about video in a big, big way, right? Yeah. So they were uh, people, they're live streaming video, uh, you know, they're recording video, they're using it for marketing purposes, and things like that. So we all are going there to learn how to do everything. Right. So thanks to Elise, uh, who uh, ended up finding Grant here. And yeah. uh, this is Grant Crawl from, uh, from 919 Marketing. He's the director of social media over there. Uh, he also has a number of, uh, I think you have your own show as well, that's on YouTube, um, or it was running in, Sort of, we'll learn more about that. In a minute, but <laughs> there's always those sort of running. Sort of right. sort of <laughs> I have a number of those. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. But uh, at least, you know, thank you for bringing him in and bringing it to our yeah. attention. We had some really good conversations as yeah. well, uh, especially about like uh, Crystal Nose, which yeah. if anyone's been listening over the last few months, we've talked about it uh, several times. Uh, we've got to slip a to, little in at that end. Yeah, in the so app we're going to have to talk a little bit more yeah. about that. But uh, And he has cool toys, too. Yeah, he, does. Really he has cool his own recorder, so I'm sure yeah, this, he'll use so it for that, his own. I, I have the little brother version. <laughs> uh, so, so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and why you love video. Sure, Greg. Well, you make it sound like I'm having a romance. Why <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I love video. The that's secret right, that's affair. Right, that's right. Uh -oh. Okay, well, well, hi, everybody in the in the online world. My name is Grant Kroll. I uh, have been in the online marketing space really since 1995. I am a dinosaur. How do you get to video? Well, before pre-video, I well graduating with a degree that I thought would be get me to be a professional cartoonist until I realized there wasn't that much money in there. Uh -huh. So I took a class on video back then, which was a, an old Amiga recorder that right. you had to do things linear and you had to spend a lot of time to get things that people can do so quickly, quickly today, but to really appreciate and to really think about what you're doing. So while things were a lot slower, uh, you had to really think about how you would craft something that would make people want to watch rather than putting stuff out that is so easy to do, but there's so much noise today. So fast forward to later, going from banner marketing to SEO, user-friendly website design. My background is pretty much in a lot of different spaces, having my own company for a good while, then working in another company, a lot of other companies like Sears, involved in the, their video program over at CDW in Chicago. And also I am YouTube certified, which means I, YouTube actually gives you uh, the top 5% of websites, people who work on those sites, a, a, a an exam and you pass that exam and you're considered to be an expert in your field. So I have a certificate from YouTube in audience development. So that's a nice way of uh, 
saying, yeah, I kind of know my stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there, there are tests for this too. And what I've really enjoyed working video early on is I was a, one of the people back in 2006 saying this is where things need to go to the SEO audience. And then writing about it and then finding other sites. One of those is Real SEO that was doing testing out a lot of things and other people would follow and I would speak at their events too. And the nice thing is since I was independent, I could tell it like it is rather than those who are giving lots of sales pitches and doing, um, showing this technology, seeing what would come and go, but also seeing that what had a lot of promise. And video to me, what do I love about video? It is the most visceral form of communication we have available to us all today. And what does visceral mean? Emotional. Mm -hmm. what, and emotion is what makes us remember. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what video is great at. We're communicating and it, it does enough for our senses to make us remember the experience. And by remember, it makes we want to relive the experience there. Uh, what I've been able to see from, I did a, an early version for Real SEO called Web Videos for Business That Suck because I would see <laughs> so many people doing so many bad things and even those claiming to be experts in video and not realizing how they are coming across. Now there's a lot of things, technical or content, but then I also could see some things as we got more into actually using it for communication, like Hangouts, like Skype, but as, as where we say now social, real-time communication and also for selling. What makes this so good talking about online video and, and, and selling is that uh, selling is the attempt to persuade people to do something, to win them, to be influential. But a part of that is, is how you communicate, how you come across. And that's where I really thought the big challenge that a lot of people, I say in sales, but all across marketing or just in general people in business have with video is something called etiquette. Mm -hmm. And what is etiquette? I mean, we understand it's just politeness in social context. And what does that mean? Like, we have a customary code of polite behavior. And that is in the context of what might be appropriate for a certain business group. It could also be appropriate for a culture. What you might do in the U.S. might not be as appropriate for what you might do in a country like China, mm -hmm. such as, you know, looking up at somebody or uh, or. Silence could sometimes be interpreted as you don't care, but in another country, it might be looked at as being polite. So it is about caring enough of how you come across to others and then doing something about it so you meet a certain standard that won't create a misunderstanding. And as you guys have been saying, there are more plat platforms are coming out. Periscope, as well as Facebook video, what you also mentioned too at LinkedIn, now we're seeing a lot more of the autoplay in there. Uh, blab, of course, which I enjoy. Uh, it is increasing and is it, ex it is expected of all of us in our communications and also salespeople. I mean, how well we communicate is how we are perceived for our politeness. And if you want to reach your goals in business, then you need to use for video what I call having a high digital empathy quotient. That means you need to show that not only you're polite, but that you care. Now, the problem with all of this is we have communication challenges. You know, while video, online video, I like to call it in this case social video, is it's open to all of us, without a proper understanding of the limitations that we face and a context to which we apply it, and it leaves us all, I say, digitally disabled. All of us are digitally disabled, no matter how much of an expert you are in this stuff. It's just a question of realizing the disability you have. Uh, you know, unless one is really tech savvy at this stuff, and they're also socially savvy and they understand these digital cultures really well, they understand the platforms really well, we unintentionally, well, we make social faux pas. And a faux pas is something you do unintentionally that makes you look bad, that makes you look the opposite of polite, of mm -hmm. business quality, of professional, or whatever your intentions are. So I've seen that happen a lot, and I've also done it a lot. And just to be aware, and the hard thing for me was to watch myself enough, but that would, that would be what I'd have to do. Why? Because I'd be interviewing a lot of people, and I would realize I'd be doing some things on videos, such as first talking too long before getting to the introduction, mm -hmm. sometimes monopolizing the conversation, sometimes maybe being way too expressive with my body language and not feeding off the other person. But at the same time, I also got to learn when I was doing some interviews of being a good listener and how to make someone trust me by paying attention to their body language and showing ways that uh, I was giving them acknowledgement, such as just nodding when being online and finding those things really make a big difference or paying attention when you say something and their eyes really get big because now you know it made a big emotional trigger. Those are the kind of cues you can get. 
challenges we all have today are like the technical issues, first off. I mean, we have bandwidth limitations. And without understanding what those limitations can be in our settings, they make us do things that without letting our guests know each other know, we might think that we are being rude or impolite. For example, talking over one another. When there's a half second delay or a longer second delay or my time's on Skype or Google Hangouts when something cuts out, we are conditioned that if there's too much silence, too much silence in between that time that somebody doesn't care for what we're saying. And we have to train ourselves in in those ways. Those were the challenges we have because of the technical issues that, that we're dealing with. But we also make faux pas because it is so easy to do that we don't really think about the quality of what we have to put in and the time we have to put in the preparation. Like, and here's some examples of big faux pas that I see people do with online video. One, they, they don't prepare them themselves in advance. They don't prepare someone in advance. They don't test the line out beforehand. Uh, they might even start recording without the other person's consent. Uh, they, they don't give their audience information or context what is going on. Sometimes they might just post something to YouTube and it might have a title that's unintelligible, there's no description, or it just goes on way too long. By the way, I, tell, I promise the audience I'm not gonna go on way too long here. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't get to their points, or they don't think about how to make it interesting to their audience to be respectful of their time, telling a story like we're doing here. So, uh, these are all problems that, without correcting them, then people will just turn it off because they have choices. While online video is exciting, there is nothing that is any excuse to not do all these things. Or in the case here, you have, a, you have a good microphone. It's a Blue Yeti, which I've used before. For people sometimes who are doing it on their own laptop, and then they're getting all the room noise, or they're getting feedback. And any of these things that are distractions hurt your message. And they, they miscommunicate, and they're looked at as being impolite and being inconsiderate to your guest. So those are a lot of things that I've seen. There's a lot more. Another thing could be is having the camera too low when you're talking with someone one-on-one rather than having it at eye level. Uh, for Accentuating how you, double chins. Accentuating double chins. <laughs> We're trying to get rid of that. Unless you like the job of the hut <laughs> version. Right. <laughs> or also not giving someone your attention. You know, yeah. Looking and doing some other things right. at the same time, especially if you ask to be on a call. Or sometimes you don't let somebody know that you're going to be on video. I've seen people do Skype and they don't let somebody know that they're there and they just turn the webcam on and then the other person might feel uncomfortable because they want to say to the person, I'm actually in my jammies or I'm not in anything right, right, right. now kind of deal. So it's that's how we're stern, not a well, <laughs> yeah, right. well, well, pe- well, people will pay to go in serious for that. Yeah, right, right, right. We can talk about that too as a show. But these are all things that I see that are faux pas because they're unintentional, but they can really be fixed. Uh, Another thing that I also see that people in sales do is have something that they know that their audience is interested in. And if they're only talking about, oh, I did this day, blah, 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 wonderful. If they should be listening to what their audience is interested in and they should be paying attention to if their audience dislikes, if they do comments. Sometimes the best thing anyone in sales can do is be helpful, is ask people if they have a question. I mean, right now I'm working with a few educators and they speak on their programs around free Um, student financial aid and I tell them at these events ask people what are the questions that they have and then offer them on your Facebook channel or wherever to do that little short video call them out by name if they'd like to be called out by name and you build these kind of connections engagement is one thing connections are the big thing where you've now established Mm -hmm. something together Uh, it really is a matter of context Like, think of what you do in a one-on-one interview, what we do here, Mm -hmm. could be very different from speaking to an audience or doing a pre-recording. Here's a good tip to think about. When we talk about video that's autoplay, think about including captions in your video. What I do is, um, obviously I put this in YouTube, I also break out the captions, which YouTube now makes it easier and easier to do captions. You can actually, um, it's basically a drag, uh, it's a drag and drop, or I would say drag and drop, but where you can adjust in the timeline so you don't have to be having a whole bunch of technical skills there. I recommend everybody, if they're doing video, they utilize the closed caption features. But how to do that? Make sure you have clear audio, because the clearer the audio is, it does speech-to-text recognition. And I'm finding now it's really improved, and 90% it can do a pretty good job on. I'm actually in a lot of videos right now on, on doing that. But here's also something to think about in Facebook, is you can upload that closed caption file. You download the closed caption file on YouTube, and you upload it to Facebook. When you upload a video on Facebook, it asks you if you want a closed caption file. 
So you do that, but here's the thing. That closed caption file will play in autoplay, even if people have their default settings in Facebook to have the closed caption turned off. What does that mean? A lot of people will watch a video while it's on mute, and they'll just read the caption. They don't need to be playing it. Oh, great point. Yeah. So that is that is a form of etiquette, it, the politeness of caring about your audience and caring about how they want to receive the information. Can I ask a question? You absolutely can. If, if I'm a salesperson and if I'm starting to consider using video, I know I need to do it to stand out, do I need to create a separate YouTube channel just to focus on my customers? Like say I already have a YouTube channel I've been building, can I incorporate it in with my personal videos? Like how would I go about setting that up and what would be your recommendation so I come off as professional? possible. I like to use the word professional, which is what a lot of, like of, of social networking, social media. It's funny, we use the word with that social, like we have to put that on or to remind people what they're supposed to do to be polite mm -hmm. and, and, and things that should come natural to us. But these are things that are a judgment call. For example, if you might work in the financial industry, then the type of videos you do, you don't necessarily want to be bringing in your personal life of, hey, here you are surfing and you're with your GoPro on there. Mm -hmm. Because the image you want to portray is somebody who is conservative, who is going to be very thoughtful and controlled with their money, as opposed to somebody who might be in a different field where you want to inspire people and get them excited. I do recommend for salespeople that they show something personal about themselves. The nice thing with YouTube is you can curate videos or a playlist from your personal YouTube channel over on to your professional YouTube channel. So you don't have Using to Using really, playlists, right? Right, or even just, um, you can just, uh, YouTube does allow you to go and take any video, like any video off any, any YouTube channel. You can take a playlist in there, like I've done with my own professional site, YouTube channel, or you can just take an individual video, but it can also, it can be from anything you see that is handy that you know your audience would like, because that helps your subscribers, because you're, you're curating content that's good for them. To, to your point there, it's, it's really about I consider it more public versus private than professional and personal. We're always going to show something about ourselves personally, especially when we're telling stories. We have to we have to fall back on what our personal stories are so that we feel we can win people's trust or earn people's trust over. That is how I would recommend for anyone in sales to do. Got it. And I'm curious, too, um, about Periscope versus YouTube. Do I need to be doing both do I how do I figure that whole game out I know a lot of people in sales are still kind of new to the periscope game but we know we should be doing it well that's a good one because the question to me is what about streaming and maybe you could define this new world of short-term streaming because that's that's growing now that we have the bandwidth and that's the area you're talking about yeah we're talking about periscope uh, there's also even some doing even snapchat now right. for the quickie stuff I, I treat, I mean, well, there's one guy I follow, Philip Phillips, for his periscopes that where he's always around. And But there's also even, um, I find C, CEOs or CMOs where they will talk to their audience. In this case, it's a, it's a one to many, but it's just them. But of course, people can send their questions, just like with Blab, if you want to have it more a little talk show format, but have anyone join in if you, if you leave one, one room open on there, like up to four people. So I treat this more as where's your audience? Test some things out, find what works for you, but don't spread yourself too thin. You know, what can, I, I find it more important is what you, can you commit to on a consistent basis. The, the key here is consistency. That is a part of what, what etiquette it is. It's being, you know, there's a code. If you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to, your, your base social is a promise. You're making a promise that if people say this is good, I'm going to be here. And, and otherwise, it's like, hey, where'd you go? <laughs> what happened? So I say everyone test these things out, do it on your own before making a you know, big announcement to your target audience, just like I do with Blab, and I test a few things out there too. And then decide for yourself, is this something you can commit to over six episodes, 12 episodes, get enough data from your audience, commit to it. Then you can honestly say that you gave it a run if it's if this is where to go or if it's time to move on. Just don't sell yourself too short with, be honest with your time and how much time you can put into it. Would you take a moment and describe, just in case people don't know, this new thing of streaming audio, which really has existed for a while, like Periscope, that has a short life. Just kind of define it a little bit in case they're not familiar with it. Because it, it's really, it's been here for a while, as you know, and now it's coming on with a greater bandwidth. Well, with streaming audio, uh, what it is, and oh, so well, it's, the same, it's really, really just treat like streaming video, like okay. uh, same thing as whether it be Ustream or I think it was Justin TV. There was a whole bunch of channels out there that, uh, and sometimes you could just simply turn the video off. And here's the nice thing is when your bandwidth is low, you could 
let people know. I always say, what good form of etiquette is let people know. Turn the video off on your side. Or if you realize that your bandwidth isn't good, just ha you can have something up on screen, which is your logo. Just settle for audio. That would be better. Uh, but to your point, what I do sometimes is I also adjust uh, the bandwidth so I let people know it's not going to be a high quality video here. It might just be a short frame so that we can make sure the audio is of a better quality. I always say always fall back on the audio. Uh, never do video at the expense of, of your audio. And, and I just want to say what I was asking about is streaming means live over the airways. Just because right. we have some people who might not know what the word streaming is. Sure, yeah. That was it. Just make sure we define it. And then the other video you like, which is our four quadrants, would you define that too? That's your other favorite. Oh, Blab? I've, yeah. en I've enjoyed Blab. I've Just enjoyed define Blab. that from, for fundamentals. Okay. All right, Blab is, I, I say Google Hangouts meets Hollywood Squares if there was four boxes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah, it, it is live video conferencing that you can also record and make to YouTube. What it is, is I, I always say check out Blab IM because sometimes talking about it isn't the same thing as seeing it. B-L-A-B dot I-M. And... These are live video conversations that go on. You can make an announcement. You can set up a time. You announce to people. There's a URL. How it works is it's based off of your Twitter handle. And then when the show is live, it can be, you can even just be in there on your own, and you can wait for other people to join. You let, and you can allow people. We had to that join. happen. We were, yeah. Our first yeah. experiment was just yeah. blabbing with someone, and then we got a bunch of people showed up. Blabbing was so. And then you get to some fellow blabbers. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's so nice because. You can see people on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, those who can tweet about it. And then if they want to tweet a question, they just enter a certain you know, tag beforehand, and then that question can appear. Or you, as the moderator, can insert that question in one of the open boxes there. So you're giving context. This is where we get into the part of etiquette, because if there are people asking questions on the right-hand side, it's good to have somebody who's kind of minding the store and mm -hmm. watching what is going on, on the right-hand side and say, okay, now we're going to take some time for questions. So I say, prepare your audience. Sometimes if it's the show's longer, perhaps every 10 minutes, let you know we'll be getting the questions again because some people will probably have joined later and they might already have a question and they don't want to feel left out. But at the same time, you don't want to let the questions get in the way of a good thing you're going uh, or a good conversation. Kind of like me talking here, monopolizing things, right? Like you ask questions. <laughs> well, two more, one of the things on Blab, Blab gives us the ability to download the video and strip off the audio for people who might want to also do podcasts. Right? That, that's right. But one thing I do recommend is I don't recommend using Blab for stripping out the oh, audio. Okay. I recommend have your own audio. And when yeah. you are doing something. cheaper than that, probably. Oh, yeah, this is a Zoom H6. This is nice. <laughs> the the These line. also have ports where it can also have a, a microphones, handheld. Right. I actually have lapel microphones, too. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't necessarily need to spend so much. It really depends on your audience. This is where I use the term business casual. Mm -hmm. it's, you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. It's more important that you're authentic, sincere, and it is, it is passable, meaning that the distractions aren't really there. It does not need to be something television quality. It's just more important that you're consistent and you're thinking about your audience and you're giving them a good experience and you're just being helpful. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I just got a great microphone that you guys recommended that yeah. was what, like 50, 50 bucks? 50 bucks. Snowball. Snowball. So there's all sorts of options yeah. out there. Yeah, uh, so, so with regards to doing more, uh, like the individual sales professional, like it could be somebody like like Elise who's out there doing coaching and she, you know, she's working through another organization, but for the most part, she's an independent salesperson, right? Uh, so having her own equipment uh, and trying to figure out how to use video in her scenario uh, would something like Periscope or, uh, or posting video on YouTube might be really great for her. Now, what about uh, the individual inside sales professional or th that maybe is working for, you know, the, the B2B organization that's selling software? Uh, using video in their situations, are they relying heavily on marketing or should they also be trying to create their own or does that cross a line with PR or? <laughs> all, it can be all the above. It all comes down to context. First, it comes down to what is your inventory, what you already have that you can mm -hmm. use. Sometimes there could be a lot of good videos that were just simply never put up. And that is evergreen. That's a term we use for what stands the test of time and still reliable and relevant. Now, if there's things that are always trending that are seasonal, it, I say, you know, put that part of your editorial calendar on what's an easy thing to do. One thing that I've done with clients is first I'll go out and I'll do like some pilot videos. I want to see who might be good to be on camera. So there are no big expectations, but it is really more of screen tests. Screen tests of who do you, sometimes who do you have yourself, but also who is in your social network, whether you're your fellow employees, if they're also independent salespeople and you're all for the same outfit, you do stuff with each other. It's so much easier to do things with other people than trying to do it all yourself. And that way you, you have 
a good content hub to work from. And at the same time, you can test and put things out. Like, let's talk about platforms. All right. For some people, if you do have an audience on Facebook, their business alliance on Facebook, even if it's B2B, like I do with, I see people on, who will put out videos that are for other people in their field because they're known uh, for the work that they do with other business people. So Facebook is perfectly good. And they'll do that on their Facebook page or list themselves as a public figure. So that way it's, it's not necessarily their business page, but it's something that is their professional page, but it's separate from their personal page, which you can do, or their profile is what Facebook calls it. Now, in the case of LinkedIn, on your LinkedIn profile, I share videos up on there. Now, I'll have videos that might be on my Vimeo account, which is a little higher level on YouTube. You can all post on YouTube as well. I'm always thinking about what is relevant to an audience. I'll embed the video sometimes in my own LinkedIn publisher, you know, the author space where you can do all your long form articles. So sometimes it's just a matter of just put the stuff out there. And I always say, do it with somebody else so you can cross market. Mm -hmm. So you thank them, you, you put them in the field. I did one recently with a, with a person who's a really well-known LinkedIn influencer. So when she liked it and she shared it, that got me a much bigger audience. Interesting. So that's that's actually a really great point on, on creating like the different types of ideas. We're, Martin and I were actually talking about this last night with some of our course development. Yeah. It's like, you know, how what what kind of guides can we provide for somebody for creating content? And we were discussing, you know, like can we do a little bit here? You know, topic is kind of narrow, and then you kind of widen it, and then you know how but specific I, macro yeah, and micro content, right? But now mm -hmm. actually creating video that gives other people praise is another way. Definitely for driving engagement. I like, yeah, make I like people it. good, make them the make them the stars. Not right. Uh, I mean, there's a term I use with being awesome, and especially applies to video. Awesome is not a word you describe yourself. It's what other people describe you right. for being so good to them. Right. It, it, it's like everybody who claims to be an expert, and you can't define yourself as an expert. Every your community has to define you as the expert. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very. Exactly. One of yep. the things I've seen uh, over the years in the video is that they they. The, I'm, I'm going to call a division between the over 40 crowd and under 40 crowd. The over 40 crowd thinks in terms of a magazine automatically. And a magazine, after you buy it, your goal is to have a catchy title so they'll read it and see the ads. Instead of understanding each one of your videos is something someone might be looking up, I find they'll put cute titles on it and then they wonder why people aren't finding it. Instead of, like you said, answering a question a real person might ask, and produce videos on it. Would you comment on that some? Because that's, mm -hmm. to me, the automatic, I look for the automatic unconscious behavior that doesn't work. Today I might call that the over 55 crowd. Okay, great, great, great. Because great. I fall in the over 40 crowd. Okay, good. <laughs> but, but to your point, because I will. I'm 56. Oh, so I okay. Guess but you're, I, you yeah. just, you just there's, all, there's a grandfather area. Yeah, that's right. There, there, I mean, having worked in the print industry, yeah. understand the industry, yeah. well, and understand the transition, those who couldn't adapt. Yeah. And who would, I mean, to me it was, we talked about video, but back then it was having the same mentality for websites and treating it like yeah. a print piece and not applying a digital context to it. Not, not thinking that this is a way that it's transforming how we communicate with each other. Not just content, but how we express ourselves, how we have dialogue. So to that point, there is something to be said about to be catchy like let's but also at the same time relevant like when i've done lots and lots of youtube videos where people see them you know watch your videos where they find them and discover them isn't necessarily through search it's in the related video areas and what do you have in related videos areas is you have a short amount of space you have your title area and then you have your image your video thumbnail that small little poster image so you have to be communicating on two different ways so in one space it can be with a thumbnail image on showcasing what is eye-catching and what grabs your attention and also the title there that is something that is, this is what I'm looking for, this is relevant out there. You just always have to think about what is your audience like. Once you've built a community, then you can start to be taking liberties with right. the titles you've used. I'll say this, the most popular video on my personal YouTube page is called The Most Outrageous Board Meeting Ever, which was a, a municipal board meeting that, that looks, that's like Jerry Springer with a gavel. <laughs> it, has, it has over 350,000 views that is still getting comments today. And, but that was in a, in a case where I knew how to optimize at least for certain words and terms. But eventually, but if the content is good enough, people will want to share it. You just have good to know how to, how to describe it. So sometimes you want it to be something they're searching for, and sometimes it's for your existing audience to grab them to get more. Right? To, your, to your point, this is where you treat video like an investment portfolio. 
like one place you have your information videos, your help videos. What are the top 10 questions you always get? The simplest thing you can do is answer those questions. I mean, and where you're doing it, sometimes if you're at an event, you can remember to record yourself on your smartphone. There is, there's even attachments now. I use a professional lapel mic with my iPhone, a lightning connector. Mm -hmm. You sure can have your selfie stick so you get it out so you don't feel like, oh crap, I gotta set up everything again. You don't have to do that anymore. But so you're always, you have a routine for yourself and, and sometimes remember, oh, so-and-so asked me this. Sometimes you get them in the shot with you if they want to be in the shot. But these are the ways first to, to get those little snack size pieces and time yourself so that you can, people can always know, oh, this help tip is going to be like 60 seconds or less. Then if you want to be telling stories like featuring stories of your audience or personal stories you have, Sharon, another part of your investment portfolio is your point of view, point of view videos. You know, what mm -hmm. makes you stand out? It's one thing to be helpful. It's another thing to be willing to be emotional, things you really care about. And then to another area would be also on sharing customer stories, client stories, stories with other people. Also, another area is what's trending. Like just like we're talking about here with LinkedIn and potential, you know, testing of autoplay videos on YouTube. These are all things that you can comment in Facebook is a place where you can, um, even though it has a short shelf life, it's also something that if you do a video and you upload to Facebook, then if you're, that will show up much higher in the algorithm than other content. So, and if you're knowing to do it short, respect people's time, hey, you add the caption here so people can read it, that counts as a view, that also improves your standing because then people are watching it mm -hmm. and you're being helpful to them. So that's why treat, treat video, whether you're, you know, if you're in selling, like an investment portfolio. I think treating video like an investment is, is critical because you're you're taking and uh, and 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 uh, putting yourself on camera. It's pretty permanent, you know. It's, it's uh, and if it ends up online, you know, it's even worse than having just a picture posted out there because it's going to stick out there, you know, for people to watch and really get the full context of what they're actually seeing. So that's important. To, to your point, I, I tell people, especially salespeople, watch yourself on video. Oh, it's painful. Uh, I, it's, it's pain. You have you have to be comfortable with compassion. Comfortable. You got to come yes. from. Yes. Think, Use your compassionate coach, uh, coach skills uh, that you already have. Easier said than done. Yeah, I got Good it. Point. Good so, point. So with all these, all of us have, you know, if you're in sales, you probably have a smartphone. Yeah. Right? And, and if you don't, uh, I, you know, good Good luck. Um, a GED phone. That's right. what we call G the GED? flip one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I usually call them dummy phones. But no, GED is the politically so. correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but all of these, you know, along with them being, you know, basically supercomputers inside, yeah. you know, they also have fantastic lenses. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I look at, I, I got this one here specifically because it has two lenses on front. This is the LG V10. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, and actually the two different lenses are just basically two different um, the. Um, Millimeter sizes. So one is a wide angle, one is a little bit tighter. One's meant for group selfies, one's meant for one selfie. Mm -hmm. um, so, but people getting, uh, salespeople in particular, just being comfortable being in front of a camera, all right, being in front of the lens it is sometimes it's really intimidating. It's very yeah, difficult it to practice. overcome. It takes, it does take a lot of practice. What have you suggested with working with clients on getting comfortable with being in front of the camera? Well, I treat it like riding a bike. The more, uh -huh. the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with riding your bike. But it's, I think, the first time for most people they're intimidated by riding a bike. Uh, but you, those who feel less intimidated is like when you have training wheels or you have a parent, someone who's helping you out. The, I always say, I like to say get a coach, but that's what I get hired right, to buy. Right. And I, we'll have I make them show notes. For yes. You. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but I also use a platform. The platform is called Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A. Yep. And that way... I can make comments, they can make comments, other people reviewing, their boss can make comments too. And the whole point is for people to be mindful of how they come across. Like I did a video interview recently with a, with a student, a student, um, a student testimonial video and for financial aid program in North Carolina. And he would have certain speech patterns that sometimes people aren't aware of. He'd like to start off saying words, right, 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 like that. And, I, and he'd forget when I would be asking him a question, I'd be off camera so we wouldn't announce the question. So I had to coach him and train him this way. Uh, I mean, there are those, even, even for those who are used to speaking in front of an audience, it's the idea of when they see a video, they think and if, and if they're not in control of it, it's permanent, or they're still, even if they're recording themselves, the fear of if I put it out there and what if it's perfect, what I get laughed at. Yeah. The way, to, the way to, to deal with that is to accept the mistakes. We're going to make excellent mistakes because that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. People are very forgivable of a lot of stuff. And you, this is the op if you, you don't know what to fix unless you put it out there and get feedback. If you want to have stuff internally, then I do recommend show this video to colleagues. Look at their stuff. 
give each other some helpful feedback, but when you put it out there, ask people for feedback. I, my first couple of times when I've done video kind of reminded me way back in elementary school when I had to get up and do the poetry contest. Mm -hmm. You know, you're standing up in front of the crowd and you're like, uh, I can't say brown bear, brown bear, and um, you know, or fuzzy wuzzy was a bear. I think that was the that was the one I did because it was short, quick, and get off the stage. Uh, I, I think um, probably some salespeople had that fear of being in front of the camera and just like, oh my gosh, you know, they're all going to laugh at me, right? <laughs> I think about a line from a movie on that. We're all going to laugh at you. Yeah, but I, I don't um, think you have to worry about pit blood being born over you right this moment, so I think you're safe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's so important because what, what you do with the clients is you've got to capture the business authentic them, uh, or it doesn't communicate the message. And, the, and I think the normal way of doing it is we fit into a what we think you ought to be on video mode which is usually a train wreck in marketing yourself. You're talking about being genuine, and, and this is the challenge that people in sales have, because I, when I was doing video in earlier years, there would be some who would want to bring their own cue cards yeah. in sales, and I remember it was one person who was an, uh, an eyeglass salesperson, and, uh, and I had a client who was a well-known um, eyeglass franchise, and they wanted to control every single thing, and it sounded so bad, so forth, so... Miss, you couldn't trust the person. You felt like yep. they were trying to, to sell you something bad. And the whole this whole thing is about trust. So I also showed them, no, for a few of the customers, leave in the ahs, leave in the ums. And I, and I showed instead the big camera equipment, do this flip cam. Why? Because they're not thinking about that big camera. When you're recording other people, do it with your phone because they're comfortable with the phone. If they see something big in, in their face, mm -hmm. then they're thinking about that. Um, I've done these kind of tests and seen for people who aren't comfortable being on camera, do it with, with your phone. That's Trend a great way to start and start beginning practice. Uh, one thing, I, if we have, I want to make sure to get you had some wonderful ideas we were going to introduce of your beginning with uh, video and so forth. Oh, God. Well, I have that more you what mentioned. not to do. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead and share it. Let's see. Well, what, what would you recommend not to or salespeople to well, not do when it comes to video? So my experience was very basic, and that's part of why I'm so glad we're having you on the show, yeah. Grant, because I wanted to stand out when I was doing digital marketing sales, and I figured one of the ways I could stand out from everybody else selling websites was to build a YouTube channel and film little videos. But I made some very rookie mistakes of uh, filming with the light behind me. Mm -hmm. So I just look like this dark, ominous shadow. Um, <laughs> which is I, good in a horror movie. Which is good in a horror movie <laughs> when you're trying to attract customers. Uh, audio was really poor. So I just, used, I just literally spoke into my laptop with mm -hmm. no additional audio support. And you would see my lips move. And then sound came out like two or three seconds later. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the thing about that that kind of ties in with this conversation is that even though they were poor quality, like to be honest, People were still so supportive. I got so many comments mm -hmm. on Facebook of people saying, we love your videos. Thank you for talking about that. We wanted to learn about that topic. And people would only give very helpful feedback and suggestions like, hey, by the way, um, for the next video, shoot it with the light coming on your face. And so I think getting past that fear of people giving you bad feedback, they really won't. Most people aren't bold enough. Most salespeople aren't bold enough to do their own videos anyway. So for the ones of us who are, who mm -hmm. know that we need to do it to stand out, um, you will get great feedback. They don't have to be incredibly professional, but using these tips, like you're teaching us, Grant, will help so that you don't make some of those rookie mistakes. Right. right I mean, it, just think business casual. And mm -hmm. you can't improve unless you do it. And, mm -hmm. and, and asking for, ask for feedback, and especially when you show your audience that you're taking their feedback, and they love that mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Uh, and then they want to be sharing some of these things. And then they, you build a connection with them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's so great to just... Everyone should try to do this. And when everyone also does has the opportunity to realize and to, that when it's a good time, that just ask for help. The problem is when people don't ask for help and they keep on making these same rookie mistakes. Then that is looked at as poor etiquette because you're not listening to your audience. You're not taking any advice, uh, sometimes just having too much pride. And then you, you turn them off. So listen, adapt, change. It, it is, I mean, this really is about social selling and a bit about customer service. Mm -hmm. Even if you're giving them something for free, they are giving you their time. Mm -hmm. Very true. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for coming in and, jo and joining us today. Uh, if anybody has any questions or anything further uh, for Grant, then we'll have some notes in the show notes on how to get in touch with you. But what is your favorite way to get 
for, for people to contact you? LinkedIn, well, or else. All right. <laughs> so, perfect. Yeah, All right, so, there should be on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Also, I, I do, even though I do have an about.me page, yeah. and I would say the best place to simply reach me is connect with me on LinkedIn, mention this show. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you. And yeah. I'm look, since I'm right now building my video netiquette guide. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, some of the stuff we talked here, a whole bunch more. Yeah. Also is some of my fellow, I call social video stylists. Yeah. And by the way, socialvideostylist.com. I'm getting that. Don't All take right. it. All right. You better get it <laughs> soon. You better get it we'll right sell now. it yes. back to you, you for you got till Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so a lot to share, and, and anybody that has a tip, a question, just some things that make you want to pull your hair out, I, I say just send it my way because I want right now to start be helpful, build a dialogue, and see where it goes. Perfect, that perfect, very good, very good. Well, again, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. Uh, so let's uh, let's go and transition to the uh, to the end here. So we have. Um, we actually, we ended up getting a little bit of feedback from somebody uh, from previous from eighty four uh, when we had mentioned that LinkedIn groups. Uh, this, the ability to search within LinkedIn groups who is slowly being deprecated. Uh, and, and somebody, uh, Jacob, who is a listener, has been listening actually, I think, since the beginning. Uh, hey, and, Jacob. And I think I believe he's from the Netherlands as well. So awesome. We have our international yeah. audience who's coming in and participating in the YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, go to youtube.com slash linking sales and you'll find us there. Uh, so if you listen to the audio portion, you'll also be able to see the majority of the video uh, versions of the episodes there too. Uh, but he mentioned that he still has access to being able to search on groups. So just kind of be aware uh, or to be able to search within a group for a specific member. So just kind of be aware that this the feature is still being kind of rolled out. It could be also being tested. They're taking to be it removed. away is the key thing. They said that they're taking it away. Uh, but if they get enough pushback, they may not take it away. So let's kind of. So where should we be? Tell them where to push back then. So make sure if you do push Twitter back. Twitter or LinkedIn or go to, everywhere. Put, make sure you push back on Twitter. Okay. Actually, honestly, uh, tweet at LinkedIn help. Yeah. LinkedIn help. Uh, and make sure that uh, that you tell them feedback. Uh, we want to be able to search group members within groups. Yeah. And, Please and tweet don't that take to that away. Right. We, you, I'm sorry. Using groups without the search feature doesn't make much sense. It gets two thumbs down from very, us. Very much so. so. Put your thumb down. There thumb we go. Down. There two, we go. Okay. Thumb down. You got thumbs down? Thumbs <laughs> there we go. Thumbs down. All right. That's, well, that's probably a lot of people. Something worse than a thumbs down. Yeah, there we go. We'll censor that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, so and the last thing is uh, social selling dot training. If you haven't taken our uh, free uh, LinkedIn profile development course and Twitter profile development course for social sellers, uh, head out to linking into uh, not linking into sales. Go to linking into sales and click on online training, and you'll that's get right. to social selling dot training, yeah. uh, which is our site. Uh, we've had actually a number of influencers come in and take the course. We've uh, actually had some discussions with, with a couple of them. All of them very, very much feel that the course is dead on. Uh, they, there wasn't anything there that they were screaming, no, that's wrong. Uh, yes. So pretty much we're doing pretty good. So. And if you if you graduate and you don't mind us sharing it, we love bragging about our new graduates. Yep. So do that. Know it's in a soft launch status. We're just telling a few people. Yeah, we're just telling you. And everybody who's yep. listening across the world. That's right. But uh, we are up. We want your feedback on it uh, because we are we are tweaking and adjust it. We just got it out, and so we're listening and working on ways to make it more customer friendly and other things. Yep. Not that it's not customer friendly now, but definitely I said go out more. there and and um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the content is awesome. Uh, yeah. But basically the experience is you're going out and like it's like you're shopping. Uh, like yeah. you're, like you would buy a t-shirt, you're buying a course from us. Uh, just except it's free. Uh, except it's totally free. So what we what we uh, want to point out is that when you do go to checkout and you have completed uh, the transaction for getting registered for the course, Click on my courses, and you'll find all of your courses inside there. Yeah. Uh, and the menu bar is on the cent- uh, on the side. And actually, by the time you're listening to this podcast, we'll probably have little pop up guides to help you along the mm-hmm. way there. So, I want to talk about an app, and then we'll get yours. Right. And yeah, that's Crystal knows yes. is the app because we we learned about it from this this yes, show guy, didn't yeah. we? I actually, okay. I actually just used it today. And what I love about it is um, the app that I was was shared to me by somebody else. Basically, it's something that it can let you know about personality of someone and yeah. how they communicate what uh, and, and how you can adjust your communication. In fact, even just today I looked at it uh, and it gave me a profile of myself, but then it also gives you a suggestion now they've upgraded for how you can adjust your email. Like I did it with one, uh, with one other office person who I could say, hey, that's pretty on cue, saying that person's conservative, likes things that are, that are shorter messages in there. It said for me, creative but uh, can also get a little long-winded or maybe not quite that way but I thought hey this is this is pretty accurate crystal knows is something that 
it gives you the context of whoever you might be about to communicate with and how you want to adjust your communication. And, and let's back up a little bit and define what is Crystal Nose. How would you describe it? If someone asked that, just give me a simple definition. Okay, and how, I guess how I define yeah, it right, is, yeah. it, it is a way of, it's emotional intelligence for the digital space. I mean, that's, that's a, that's and a high level. Faces to LinkedIn and your email. And your email. If you, email. If you use Google, if email, you use, right? If you use Gmail on there. And that's why some people really prefer to use one email platform or another. Yeah. And because Google and, uh, has apps that you can be included in the course of your correspondence. So it really is just a nice way if you can actually click the button and then it will first give you a summary of what that person's persona is. And then it might show other words to describe them and then give some recommendations for how you might want to communicate with that person. And if you so want, it can give you an example of how to communicate with the person. Yeah, I, 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 we, we've actually checked our profiles out and it is pretty darn accurate yeah, for us. Yeah. So uh, one of the... Except by not buying your shoes. It said if you really want to <laughs> get... Buy me shoes. <laughs> I'm signing up so I can stock you. I, 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 buy me so, shoes. But, but what, it, what, it, uh, what I find that is, that is pretty interesting is that how it aggregates or where it gets its data from in order to create this personality profile for you. Uh, it, we, we recommend when even when developing LinkedIn profile, you know, trying to figure out what to write in the summary because sometimes people have a hard time articulating the, their own selves, right? They, they don't understand, like, you know, um, you know, what kind of characteristics do I have as a working professional and how do, how do you share that with somebody else? But actually going out and using this to look at your own profile to, or to look at how you appear on social and other ways as well, I guess they, they probably fill in some data, and then, uh, and then display this personality profile of yourself uh, or, uh, or the person you're, you're, you're prospecting. Uh, I think that aggregation of that data is pretty, pretty incredible. I want to give a quick example. I was in uh, D.C. I go up about once a month, and uh, I was, we were at a, a coffee shop, and uh, I saw someone that would be a good lead for my friend, and I, I started the conversation. We talk a little bit, and then he's starting to write a follow-up note right at the coffee shop. And then I go, well, I recommend you do this, this, this in the note. And he goes, how do you know that? And I said, I looked him up on Crystal Nose. And it matched the intuitive data we had gotten from him and reinforced it and gave more ideas right there. So he was like blown away of that. And, they, and they're very generous with a free version than a paid if you really need to use it. Yeah, and say in the field of social selling that the paid version is definitely worth looking into. Yeah. But, I, but I also say is is to take the time to read someone's profile, yeah. to look at what they do, so you have something to talk about. I mean, there's thing. I mean, I have a whole area on LinkedIn etiquette, part of my French, where people act like digital douches because right. they never take the time. <laughs> be they just show. have connections and they just want to yeah. spam you. Yeah. That'll, that'll, that'll be the Stern, Howard Stern version. Yeah. But that, that and, and that, that that goes to beyond just a faux pas. That goes yeah. to oh, I don't, I don't want to be bothered, right. but I want to bother everyone else. Right. If you want attention, you have to pay attention. Yeah. And if you want the right kind of attention, then you have to be looking at these things and yeah. be honest with it. how are you coming across. Ask other people how are you coming across. In wrap up, did was there something else you wanted to add? Because I, I jumped in with that. No, uh, I was just going to say I wanted to talk about Crystal Nose. Oh, good. Okay, okay good, it. good. And Excellent. I signed up officially. So yeah. if, uh, if anybody else wants to check out Crystal Nose, just kind of keep in mind we are not affiliates yep. and we're not affiliated with the company at all. But we, we will accept their money. <laughs> 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 we won't say no. Uh, but uh, and if Crystal Nose wants to uh, definitely support us, you know where to get us and yeah. get Grant as well. Yeah. Uh, but go to Crystal Nose, which is uh, C R Y S T A L K N O W S dot yeah. com to sign up. And if you use Gmail with the Google with, with Google Chrome, get their extension as well, so yeah. that we can Very during good. your trial period you can check out because it does make suggestions on how to reword your email so that we had, it's appropriate for the person you're contacting. So. Anyways, I think that wraps that up wraps today. Up. Yeah. So thank you very much again for joining us. Appreciate Excellent. coming down here. Great show. Uh, and it's uh, been my organic pleasure. And by the way, that's my last tip. Yeah. You don't always have to do things online and video. Come in person and make a video together. That's, that's right. Really, yeah. really fun. That's well, good. this is Martin Brossman. I'm Greg Heyer. And I'm Elise Archer. And you've been watching or listening to the Linking Into Sales Social Selling Podcast. Be sure to follow us on uh, on uh, Twitter, on Facebook, uh, come out and join our LinkedIn group. Don't forget to go out to socialselling.training, subscribe to us on YouTube, and uh, and subscribe to us on iTunes. Make and sure keep the comments coming. Yeah, absolutely. Keep, keep the engagement coming. We love it. Uh, we want to help you guys out and make sure you guys are as successful as possible with social selling. Have a great weekend.